A full year before America officially joined the war against Hitler, Captain America comics depicted Captain America bashing Hitler on the face with the caption, face to face with Hitler. So this was very advanced of Simon Kirby to come up with this, but they weren't the first people to, in the comic world, engage with the Nazis. Marvel Mystery Comics number four, the fourth ever Marvel comic, uh, has a swastika on the cover and the Submariner attacking the German U-boats. However, that wasn't the first swastika on a comic. That was Top Notch Comics number two in January 1940. Then in September 1940, Simon Kirby had Marvel Boy versus a character called Hiller. Now, I don't think that could in any way be construed to be a real-life person. However, by the time it got to December 1940, Martin Goodman, the publisher, declared that Hitler could be the enemy instead of an imaginary one. Captain America was a huge seller, not surprisingly, but it's fantasy. It's fantasy. The first ever comic dedicated to just war stories was War Comics. Terrific title, which Martin Goodman later ripped off. That's from Dell, from it only lasted four issues, unfortunately, May 1940 to September 1941. However, the first successful comic all about war was military comics, from Quality Comics and um, the Will Eisner Studio. Military comics lasted for 43 issues between August 41 and October 45. Its main strip was Black Hawk by Chuck Quidera, Will Eisner, Bob Powell. Nobody remembers exactly who did what, um, but those are the three people who deserve credit. This was produced in Eisner's Tudor City studio near what is now the United Nations building. This is relevant because the whole thing about Black Hawk was that the team was made up of people from a United Nations. Black Hawk himself was Polish-American, Stanislaus was from Warsaw, Chuck was another American, Olaf was Swedish, Andre was French, you get the idea. This trophy was um, something that became common in other strips that dealt with the war. Detective comics, for example, eventually featured Simon Kirby's Boy Commandos, and the boy commanders were from France, England, Netherlands, and Brooklyn. The boy commandos started in the winter of 42 and was a huge seller. It was very, very popular. Unfortunately, in the midst of all this popularity, Jack Kirby was called up for the army. He joined the military on Monday, June the 21st, 1943. By uh, August 44, he was in the 11th Infantry under General Patton, no less. In August 23rd, 44, he was in Omaha Beach, Normandy, just two months after the D-Day landing. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, he was hospitalized in France and, and dismissed from the army and re returned to the United States in January 45. Now, if you're a student of genre, as we all are, I suppose, the one thing I would recommend to everybody is to have a look at Martin Goodman's comics. If Martin is publishing it, then it's popular. Simple as that. Um, from December 49 to January 60, Martin Goodman published no less than 397 individual books on the subject of war. For example, he stole the title War Comics from Dell. Um, his longest lasting one, though, was Battle, which lasted 70 issues, got a very respectful run. Over at EC Comics, we finally get comics which are not really fantasy at all. They are short stories about wars. This started with Two Fisted Tales in November, December 1950. There were very special issues. Number 26 dealt with the Chan Jin Reservoir. Number 31 and 35 dealt with the, the American Civil War, maps and everything you could study in school. Number 33 contains probably Wally Wood's best ever strip, Atom Bomb, 
Um, thoroughly recommended if, if you can get a copy of it. The mastermind behind all these was Harvey Kurtzman, uh, and he will appear a number of times in this event. It must have been reasonably popular for Bill Gaines to publish uh, Two Fisted Tales because he started publishing Frontline Combat in July, August 51. Number five has probably the most famous uh, EC war story, The Big If. What was happening in DC Comics at the time? Well, they had a slightly different approach. What they liked was um, characters, character-led war stories. So you had the Losers, for example. You had Haunted Tank. You had Sergeant Rock. You had The Magnificent by Joe Kubert, Enemy Ace, from our, in, in our army at war it started. Sergeant Rock lasted for ages, lasted right into July 1988. Now, these are perfectly reasonable stories, but I want to dwell on them for one particular thing, a different kind of war, war on intellectual property. 53 years after Roy Lichtenstein ripped off Russ Heath or Wham, Russ Heath was able to recreate it. What do you mean he ripped off Russ Heath? Surely Roy Lichtenstein, a famous American artist, merely saw a comic on a newsstand and memorized this picture or, or it, it stuck in his mind and he reproduced it in this big, huge canvas. Well, yes, he said that's from Our Fighting Forces um, number 89, uh, sorry, All American Men of War number 89. And the following issue, number 90, there's Wingmate of Doom by Jerry Grandinetti, which mysteriously, he not only remembered the pictures, three pictures, but he also remembered all the dialogue. And it became As, As I Opened Fire in 1964 by Roy Lichtenstein. I think that's purely plagiarism, but you don't have to go along with me. However, there are many other examples, and maybe if you Look through all those examples, you'll agree, yes, it was just plagiarism. So Kirby's back from the war. He's, he's back in, in partnership with Joe Simon. They very foolishly decide to publish themselves, just as comics sales are going to decline because of Frederick Wertham, the Comics Board Authority, etc. But they self-published four comics, In Love, Police Trap, Bullseye, and a particularly good war comic called Foxhole. Foxhole was real war experiences by actual war survivors, including Kirby. Unfortunately, money-wise, sales-wise, etc., the inventory had to be sold to Charlton. A sad end, for actually, Foxhole itself contains some of Kirby's best artwork, in my humble opinion. It's 1955, EC, is making a last ditch attempt to have comics before they went over full time to Mad Magazine. So they launched Impact. Impact lasted for five issues, but it's number one is the most important one. This is an oft reprinted story, Master Race, by Bernie Krigstein. The script is probably by Bill Gaines and or Al Feldstein, but again, nobody really remembers because Bernie Krigstein completely restructured it. It's been called, and I agree, one of the finest stories ever to appear in the comics forum. Moving into the 60s now, Stan Lee was united with Jack Kirby again after a spell many, many years ago and on various books. And Stan felt that he and Kirby had developed a formula which would work in any genre. So he persuaded Martin Goodman to let them publish Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos. The Howling Commandos were made up, guess what, of people of different races from different countries. I think we've heard that idea before. A couple of years later, in 1965, over at a new publisher of magazines, in order to escape the comics code, they published magazines, they, they weren't covered. Um, and it was Warren Publishing, Jim Warren. He published Blazing Combat four quarterly issues edited by Archie Goodwin. Jim 
Jim Warren himself told Harvey Kurtzman that his work at EC was the inspiration for Blazing Combat and that the magazine would be anti-war. Many artists who had worked in the EC books uh, worked on Blazing Combat, but Archie Goodwin wrote most of the stories. The settings varied as they had in the EC books, but they were not a mere imitation, they're every bit as good. However, Blazing Combat number two, Archie's script, Landscape, got them into a bit of trouble. It provides a very sympathetic portrait of a Vietnamese peasant rice farmer not long after that conflict started. This book caused a problem. Jim Warren was warned that many of his distributors and wholesalers belonged to the American Legion and would not take kindly to an anti-war comic. The armed forces used to sell comic magazines um, in their PX stores, post-exchange shops for GIs, but they refused to sell Blazing Combat. Distributors would keep their magazines in their warehouses and then return them unsold. So Jim was losing money. There was eventually a threat to stop taking any foreign publications. And so Blazing Combat was cancelled in the land of free speech. Finally, back to Marvel and one of their finest moments. The NAM started in 1986. But I've got to tell you a wee story first. Did you know that some Nazis had fled the tribunals after the war and joined the foreign, French Foreign Legion? Then, because they were in the French Foreign Legion, they fought against the Viet Minh until 1954. I didn't get this from a BBC documentary. I got it from the NAM comic book. It was created by Doug Murray and Michael Golden with Larry Hammer as the editor. Doug was an actual infantryman. He described long periods of boredom which were punctuated by eternal moments of terror. The purpose of the comic was always to tell what really happened to that generation of GIs. They intended to cover the Tet Offensive, the horror of My Lai, the problems of the ever-present drugs. Now, Stan Lee's Spider-Man in 1971 had forced a change in the comics code towards drugs, so they were allowed to depict them. Doug used some actual vocabulary from the war, originally Japanese, like Moskoshi, which means right now, right away. Later with Vietnamese, no sweat did that, which means easy. So you can um, integrate them into your talk. Doug was trained as a teacher, but he teaches through his writing. Some of his comrades who didn't make it are actually in the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C. The comic was planned to be in real time. So, for example, issues one to four are, are designed to take place in January to April 1966. Number seven, The Good Old Days, is about the roots of war. To try to show that the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese are not just nameless, godless enemies. Rather, they are people just like us. The comic, however, eventually ran into another type of trouble. Not Blazing Combat's problem, Marvel had good distribution by this time. But by number 40, the sheen had gone off. It was no longer the original conception. And then in number 52, Frank Castle joined the mob. Eventually, the Punisher, Frank Castle's alter ego, seems to be handling the Vietnam War single-handedly. And so, after all these years, where we started with fantasy and Captain America assaulting Hitler, we end up with fantasy again. Perhaps it's true that mankind cannot stand too much reality. <laughs>